and then but on race day goes hyper high on that so yeah some i mean we obviously know he's like a freak of nature but like yeah. some people i think that just i think that all goes and just like points out the importance of doing like experiments yourself and like individual indiv mm -hmm. individual variability and like your physiology i mean somebody you might be a higher fat burner than another ultra guy who's going to just be like smashing the carbs during an ultra you mm -hmm. know marathon and so like like you said, people can go and if they're interested, you can go and see what your like fat oxidation and carbohydrate oxidation rates are during a test and like use that to inform your training. But it's like, yeah, the, there are hydration guidelines. There are carbohydrate guidelines for athletes, but like, mm -hmm. so that's, you know, for av on average, that's going to work for like most athletes. It might not work for you. It might not work for everybody. Um, some people can't like eat anything, you know, mm -hmm. during or before a race. And it's like, we're well, going to have to figure out a way to, to kind of bypass that. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting that everybody can, can respond differently and, doing no gut training and being able to tolerate that. I mean, it's just, you know, maybe he just got, he just got lucky with that. Uh, yeah. Being able to do that. I mean, I'm, I say lucky, but he obviously is like doing incredible like training runs and I'm sure there's something t to what he's doing that allows him to not have to gut train, but you know, mm -hmm. who knows what that might be. Yeah. Yeah. You, you want to be careful with the outliers in terms of how right. you structure your stuff, which is also interesting. Cause when you look at just, I mean, the, the most basic data that has kind of gotten pushed around in the endurance world for a while is like 90 grams per hour where you have like, and this is, I guess, been altered to some degree, but originally it was like 60 grams, 30 grams from a, um, like a, a maltodextrin to a, uh, fructose mm -hmm. spread. So you can kind of have the pathways allow you to get 90, whereas by themselves, you'd only be able to do, you'd have to do less than that. Whereas now I think you can technically do more fructose without having to worry about it. But anyway, it was like you know, 90 grams is an average. So are there people that can do 120 and absorb it? Probably. Right. Are there people who can only do 60? Yeah, that's probably also true. So uh, you, at some, at a certain point when you get like Tour de France athletes, it's probably going to start selecting for that to mm -hmm. some degree where everything lines up by the time you find yourself winning the Tour de France or competing at the Tour de France. So maybe the majority of those guys are just able to absorb a higher amount of carbohydrate than what we would expect and therefore getting up to those 120 plus grams is going to be beneficial. Uh, who knows? <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. Like eventually are we going to get to a point where like the ability to win a race is just going to come down to like who can, who can fuel the most and who can tolerate the most. I mean, you think that it would eventually maybe like get to that point where, you know, everybody's lining up at the line. Everybody's got a freaking super high VO two max. Everybody has the latest, technology and the super shoes mm -hmm. everybody has yeah. you know the optimal like wind resistant cl or you know the aerodynamic clothing and stuff it's like we're all on a level playing field everybody has the latest in nutrition everybody has the latest in training it's like when it comes to race day like is it just going to be like who can absorb and who can like fuel the best during mm -hmm. the race like is it just going to become a uh like a f1 race where like yeah. the pit stops are just like the yeah. most important aspect where you just got to fuel yourself and get to the line i mean it's kind of interesting and like are the best athletes guys like kipchoge i mean is he able he's obviously an incredibly talented runner but like something about him makes him special to like break that two hour marathon barrier is it because he's able to you know take in 120 grams per minute because like that might be required to mm -hmm. break the two hour marathon barrier um i think there was there was a recent study and I didn't read it, but I was reading a synopsis of it where they, they ran models basically about like what elite athletes would have to eat to break the two hour marathon barrier. And mm -hmm. it was something in the range of like hundred, 120. So really? that's basically saying like, if you can't, if you can't take that in during, you know, your marathon, then you have no shot at, right. at breaking the two hour marathon barrier. Cause that's just like the fuel required yeah. required to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So the listeners can just probably assume they're not breaking a two hour marathon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so, man. Too bad. Yeah. <laughs> Bro broken dreams for me, I guess, and everyone else listening. <laughs> yeah. The other interesting side of just kind of like running those numbers too, is when you step away from the elite athletes and you think of like, what is the output that the, a normal average person mm -hmm. training for a marathon is going to produce where I think is where you we're going to see the backlash of the gut training stuff and the high fueling strategies, because it's like, yeah, you get someone like Kipchoge, and some of these guys who are well north of a thousand calories per hours of work and maybe need that mm. when they're following a moderate high carbohydrate diet. But then you take the average person who they might be getting, they might be much closer to say like six, 700 mm. calories per hour. So for them, it's like the amount of energy output they're doing per hour may only be the carbohydrate side of the elite athlete from a total energy. So for them, it's like, 
they don't need to be going anywhere near that right. in order to meet the demands of the the job so like how much more digestive issues are we going to get with that population versus the highly tuned like stress tested over and over again in training elite athlete where they know like what their body's going to probably do with the inputs they're giving it yeah the pipeline from like the elite athletes down to just your you know weekend warriors or whatever is like always interesting and that's where the criticism mm -hmm. you know everybody loves to criticize gatorade it's like oh you, you know yeah. you don't need gatorade to fuel your like 5k <laughs> and stuff like that well it's like it wasn't created for that i mean i know they're marketing right. for anybody who does like sports but yeah it is interesting i'm sure there will be backlash because you're going to get the average person thinking they need to, you know, take in 100 to 120 grams per hour when they don't. So